Um, and now we will have the talk by the organizer, and that's a good possibility to thank Pini Ifagan that he brought all of us together here. <laughs> I will present the, the paper on the, on the screen so you can follow when I'm reading it. And not like all the, the important discussion that we have until now, I will presuppose in my, my, um, in my paper that I don't know nothing about the biography of Hans Blumenberg. I don't, I, I know, I don't know the story. I just got from someone a book, and the book is Work on Myths, and I'm trying to read it. And Let's see what I find in this book, what is the problem, and you will not hear nothing about not National Socialism, not Schmidt, nothing. We have only the book. So let's try to make a reconstruction of a book that someone told you that is an interesting book. So let's do it together and to see. So I would like to open my paper with two basic presuppositions that guide my approach as a reader of Bloomberg's works. The first presupposition is that Bloomberg is a philosopher. He is not an historian of ideas, or a literary critic, or a brilliant essayist, but a philosopher. The second presupposition, which follow from the first, is that his writing should be viewed as presenting arguments and justification for the claim they advance. Both presuppositions are highly disputable. We saw that today. Presupposing them does not imply that without them, it is not worthwhile to read and study Bloomberg's rich and fascinating writing. But it helped framing the contour of my own reading and expectation from my, expectation from my encounter with Bloomberg thought, Bloomberg's thought. In what follow, I will try to apply this reading to Bloomberg's work on myth. Work on myth? Oh. Work on Myth is a peculiar book. It is a book that its opening pages seems in another attempt to lay down an answer to very old question, what is myth? But soon the reader realized that this is not the case. The reader discover that what Blumenberg aims at is, is actually a critique of one of the basic narrative of the history of ideas that describe the development of Western civilization as the move from mythos to logos. If that is all, it is relatively easy to suggest a conceptual relationship between Bloomberg's theory of the emergence of myth and the way it can be used to undermine the narrative scheme, schema from mythos to logos. It will be misleading and too simplistic to claim that what Bloomberg's offer in the first two parts of the book are only speculative story about the emergence of myth and, and the critique of a well-known historical narrative concerning Meat making. The first two parts of are full of conceptual distinction and observation that help the reader to grasp Bloomberg's alternative account of what meat is. He is doing that <coughs> to mention very briefly the major issue by clarifying the distinction between meat and the science and the sciences, between theoretical and mythical knowledge, between dogma and myth, between the mystical and the mythologic and the mythological and draws from them, uh, from them a specific characteristic that, he assumes, captured the essence of mint, its, it, its significance, or bedotzamkeit. From this wave of distinction, clarification, together with the concept of significance, we can reconstruct what could be called th uh, Bloomberg's theory of meat. Such a theory deserves a chapter Hans Blumenberg, A Theories of Meat, in a book called Theorizing About Meat by Robert Segal, for example. But as one reads on work on meat, a new aspect presents itself, this time in the form of very condensed history of meat of Prometheus, from its first appearance and through its long res uh, reception in the intellectual history of Western culture, this, the third part of the book, can be read as a, a separate essay that follow one of the most formative stories describing the emergence of human being and its culture. To choose to tell and follow this particular con constitutive story about the birth of human culture can be motivated in a different way, each one of which can be posit, posit the reader in a totally different context. The reader is not presented with a clear statement by Blumenberg 
regarding his motivation to trace the history of the Prometeo story and what sort of conceptual relationship, if any, it has with the first part of the book in which Blumenberg present his version of a theory of myth. This ambiguity opened the way for the reader to relate to the Prometheus story as a book within a book, or at least to see the second part of the book altogether detached from the first. But let us say that our imaginary reader can find a reasonable way to bring together the first three parts of the book by assuming that the first and second part are Bloomberg versions of theory of myth, and the third part is a kind of a case study that exemplifies the theory by a concrete historical example. For example, the reception history of Prometheus myth can be seen as a manifesting the following claim that opened the second chapter in the book. Myths are story that are distinguished by a high degree of constancy in their narrative core and by an equally pronounced capacity for marginal variation. These two characteristics make myths transmissible by tradition. Their constancy produce, produces the attraction of recognizing them in artistic or ritual representation as well as in the uh, recital, and their variability produce the attraction of trying uh, out new personal means of presenting them. It is the relationship of team and variation with attractiveness for both com uh, a composer and listener is familiar from music, so myths are not like holy text, which cannot be altered by one iota. The word of myth, page 34 in the English version, of course. It is plausible to claim that the reception history of Prometheus can function as a proof that Prometheus' story is a myth because of its compliance with the above description. To meet this description does not turn the Prometheus story necessarily into a myth because it's easy to show that there is, that there are a lot of other candidates that can meet those requirements. So if we want to insist and claim that Prometheus, that the Prometheus reception history function as a case study, we have to draw on uh, other criteria suggested in the first two parts of the book and to evaluate their adequacy to the Prometheus myth. And indeed, Bloomberg suggests several other characteristics that can be used to determine what turn a story into a myth. But most of them are more or less variation on the above descriptive criterion that myth are story which have a constant core that undergo modification without losing their meaning. If this is the case, then it seems that we need to re to reverse the relationship between reception history of Prometheus and the theoretical claim, what turns story into myth? The reason that I argue for this reversal is because what we explain by the theory of myth is that the fact that we, that we can <coughs> first present a reception history of a story that has enduring core through its modification and not the other way around. The question, that start our investigation of myth seems to be contingent fact that we present a long history of myth of Prometheus. So there is in fact a good reason to, uh, to claim that the reception history is not a case study of the theory of myth presented in the first part of the book, but it is the historical material that enable us to draw from it a general, uh, a general characteristics of what make a story a myth. If this constitutes the conceptual relationship between the first two parts and the third, then we can say that the main question of the book, Work on Myth, is to quote Blumenberg himself, could Kafka or Jid have managed in their determined modification of mythical themes to forego the Prometheus myth? Can we imagine it having vanished from our store of tradition at some times or other? The easy and not unjustifiable answer will be inconceivable. 
But this move presents us only with one side possible answer to the, to, to the nature of the conceptual relationship between the different parts of Bloomberg's book. The reason for that is located in Bloomberg's description of the, function, uh, of the function that telling story is fulfilling. Quote, stories are told in order to kill, the tribe something, in the most harmless but not least important case to kill, to kill time. In another and more serious case, to kill fear. The letter contains both ignorance and more fundamentally unfamiliarity. In connection with ignorance, what is important is not that supposedly better knowledge such as later generation in retrospect have considered themselves to possess what, knows, what was not available even very good knowledge about what is invisible, like radiation or atoms or viruses or genes, does not put an end to fear. What is archaic is the fear not so much of what one does not yet know as merely of what one is not acquainted with. As something one is not acquainted with, it is nameless, as something nameless. If we accept this description, then our imaginary reader can have a very clear answer to his query regarding the Prometheus reception history. It is, this, it is a history of one story that helps us kill fear. And by doing that, enable us to continue our human existence. So the question is not what, why certain stories survive while others not, but what make the Prometheus story one among others qualify as a story that has power to kill fear. That is mean that there is some hidden quality which is embedded in that particular story that turns it into an instrument that has the ability to control and manage the basic anxiety which human beings are facing. To answer these questions, move us in a totally different way than the one in which we we're asking about story whose core idea can endure change without losing their identity. It is undeniable that this question can find its answer in any particular myth, whatever. Answer to the former question could be found only in a highly speculative account why and when human adopt storytelling as a tool that enable them to cope with crisis that endanger their very existence. The speculative story with which Plumenberg opened his book is not and cannot be a myth because it explains why we began to tell story, but it cannot explain why certain stories are equipped with particular quality that enable them to survive radical modification and to have, uh, and sorry, and so have a history of their own. There is a, there is an explanatory gap between why and when we began to tell a story and, and the fact that there are stories, myths, that kept core meaning which can be re-identified through its various disguises. The claim that we can follow the reception history of the Promosteo story is sufficient to explain only its endurance over time. It is clear that we achieve that only on the basis of the, of the apostolary fact that we, t we hold or that we are able to retell the historical material that compose it. The, pre the a priori claim that we tell story in order to survive, in order to reduce unbearable anxiety, has no conceptual link to the fact that we can construct the reception history of Prometheus Prometheus myth. In Bloomberg terms, we can claim the basic distinction between the work of myth, the casual hypothesis about the function or role of storytelling, and work on myth, the thesis about its uh, repetitiveness and continuous presence, is missing an intermediate component that can account for the transition from the work of myth to the work on it. If we go back to our imaginary reader, she could make sense of reading Prometheus' history 
as a case of work on meat, but she is left unsatisfied with regard to the essential question, why is it to begin with a meat? There is a possible answer that could combine together, together the two characteristics of meat that Bloomberg suggested. We could claim that by tracing the Prometheus reception history, we provide not only a justification for being a core story that can endure modification, we, no we could actu actually use this fact to claim that by surviving those modifications, the Prometheus story suggests itself as the fulfillment of the evolutionary function of storytelling as a tool to overcome fear, as mean to avoid unbearable absolutism of, absolutism of reality. But the major difficulty of our imaginary reader who try to follow the argument of the book is still uh, lying ahead. By the end of part three, Bloomberg inter uh, interrupt his detailed description of the reception history of Prometheus meat, roughly at the end of the 18th century, and part four beginning with a very detailed portrait of Goethe's complex relationship to the Prometheus myth. This portrayal led some reviewers to name the entire book Bloomberg's Goethe book. A clear reason for that can be found in the opening lines of the fourth part of the book. A quote, everything up to this point is after 300 pages of very condensed Bloomberg and prose. Then come this, uh, this quote, and also uh, my good friend Eva Short that read the book all the time told me that when, when she got to these passages, she said, I don't understand why he said it so. so um, it, when it, why he emphasized the following? Yeah. Everything up to this point in this book as a guardian, a, as a grandin, all the lines converge on a hidden vital point at which the work expend, expended on meat could prove to be something that was not fruitless. It was not fruitless if it could feed into a totality of one life, could give its contour of its self-comprehension, its self-formulation, indeed its self-formation, and this in a life that is open for our access, without the merciful hiding places that we all demand for, demand for ourselves. This is feasibility, if you want, and that you need to hide, etc. You can find it now here in this quote. For the reserved manner of subtle silence in which, according to Nietzsche, uh, remarks, Goethe was an expert, did so little to remove, uh, to remove him from view that not much has been left for supposedly pitiless unmasking to do. End of quote. For our imaginary reader, who is eager to get some clear-cut statement about the overall argument and structure of the book, it is something he can hold to and use as a point that brings together all the various components into one wall. At first sight, it seems that the reader finds what she had been looking for through her reading. Bloomberg tells his reader that his claim about the origin of meat and the reception history of Prometheus is the means used by one exceptionally talented human being to describe and understand himself. In this specific sense, we may be supposed to understand work of meat as a book about Goethe. If this is the case, it, be it can be claimed that the first three parts of the book are preparatory for the analysis of the towering figure of Goethe. His own work on meat especially his work on Prometheus myth, can be used as a key to understand Goethe's life's tragedy, how and by what means he successfully avoided or deterred difficulty that confronted him through his life. Bloomberg tried to waken the reader's impression that all those chapters that do not deal with straightforwardly with Goethe are only means to understand that great figure. He is doing that, but emphasizing that his reading of Goethe 
is introduced into the discussion not because it is an exemplary life strategy that we should follow, but he still want to argue that Goethe's search for meaning, Lebensin, is unique because of the way he uses images to, quote, master anti-irrational anti with resources of this kind of intellectual organization, end of quote. So can we understand the tense to Goethe strategy, a life strategy, as a paradigmatic example of working of meat and not just another version on the work on meat? If our answer to this question is positive, we, can, we could argue that to follow get a life struggle from childhood, uh, from the childhood traumatic experience of the Lisbon earthquake through wartime and the meeting with Napoleon is actually a way to observe how meat functions as a de depletion mechanism. Thus, the Prometheus meat and the way Goethe use it, use it will not just be another modification of the core story of Prometheus, but it will function actually to kill or overcome fear. The reception history of Prometheus myth established the fact that it is an image that survived modification and could be considered as a possible candidate to fill the role of a tool that help us cope uh, with the terror of the absolutism of reality. The life experience of Goethe is supposed to demonstrate to the reader the myth actually, how, sorry, how the myth actually fulfill its function. Goethe's search for meaning was not driven by the search for true or the quest for knowledge, by the urgent need to take refugee, uh, refugee behind images. This can explain the fact that the materials that take, centers, that take center stage in Bloomberg's narrative of Goethe are not his published work, but a detailed description of his life as a manifest in his diaries, letters, and conversation with his close friends. A life that has been challenged and demanded an action, an action that used story that were already at his disposal having survived a long history, which made those stories suitable for creating the safe place in which Goethe could take refuge. Re refuge. We could, of course, read that part of the book with, which discussed Goethe as an extended case of work on myth, being a moment in the history of the Prometheus myth as to detach it from the specific role in the overall argument of the book. But I think it will be an easy way out of the challenge that Bloomberg's unique argumentative procedure presents us with. Instead, I think one should read the book on work on myth as another Bloombergian attempt to offer a philosophical explanation or philosophical justification of its basic anthropological thesis with which he opened the book. This argumentative structure which start with anthropological thesis and uses different conceptual means to justify it. Is not unique to work on myth, but is repeatedly found in Bloomberg's writing ever since the anthropological turn in his thought. The anthropological turn entail a new role, not only for metaphors, but also for myth. It implied that even from the perspective of their original, non-pragmatic function, metaphor and myths are preconditioned for, for the possibility of the anthropological ar argument. Taking the work on myth to provide a sustained historical evidence give rise to, be, to the possibility of providing an explanation of the emergence of myth in non-conceptual term. The myth's resilience in the face of the unceasing effort of conceptual discourse to render them obsolete, attested to the plausibility of the anthropological argument. In this respect, work on myth, the book, and the activity constitute a sustained evidence that conceptual discourse has failed to root out myth and thus vindicated the anthropological thesis. The reception 
history of Prometheus in Goethe's life experience should be read as an evidence that refer back a justification to the anthropological account of the emergence of meat itself, or if you will, to the emergence of human culture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pini. <coughs> um, so there's a couple of things that I could say that would bring together other things that people have said so far today. As far as I'm concerned, Blumenberg's theory of myth is an anti-Platonic one, or you could also say an anti-Jungian one, right? In the sense that he doesn't want um, to suggest that myths are universal eternal archetypes that are somehow collectively present in the human mind. Rather, as you correctly pointed out, he basically says that we only know about the Prometheus myth because it survived, right? And because it is, it is survived, right? And this relates to what I said before in my lecture, the myths were performed in front of audiences and those which survived are, the, are those which were the most significant, the most convincing, the most attractive to the audience. So that Blumenberg's ex explanation of this is to say that there's no such thing as archetypes in the eternal mind, rather we only have, we only know these things by virtue of the fact that they have survived. Mm -hmm. And this, ex this is why, or this is how <coughs> He makes the argument, or he defends the accusation, why have, you, why have you just written about Prometheus? He says, I've written about it because it's one of the best survived myths, right? It's, and, that, and that kind of demonstrates the theory. Now, in relation to what you said about how to read work on myth, work on myth is in a sense a myth about myth. That's the way I see this book. Or to use uh, Thomas's phrase, it's a, it's a philosophical novel. <coughs> because in a sense, the, the, um, the Prometheus story is part of the tale that Blumenberg tells about humankind at the beginning of the book. This is the story which, um, which was told before it, in Oliver's lecture, namely that the human being needed to develop culture in order to survive a harsh environment when they left the rainforest and moved out onto the savanna. This is Promethean, right? Why is it Promethean? Because in Plato's Protagoras and also elsewhere, exactly the, the same argument is made, right? That the human being was poorly adapted, therefore they needed culture and rhetoric in order to survive. So I think we can read, in answer to the, to the, to the way you've presented your paper, I think the theoretical or methodological anthropological perspective of work on myth absolutely fits in with the, with the Prometheus myth. We can't separate the two. In fact, Blumenberg's work on myth is itself a myth, right? Because he says, the anthropological account that I give of the human being is not one that I can prove or disprove. It's rather one that we use because it's functionally effective in enabling us to understand what a, what a, what a human being is. It's a description of the human being which you can accept or reject, but it's not one that you can prove. Why not? Because we can't go back to the beginning of, of time and see this. And secondly, because the paleo paleoanthropological evidence is so weak that we can't make an argument on this basis. So I think <clears throat> um, in answer, I very much liked your paper. And my answer to the question how to read work on myth is to say that the methodological aspects and the mythical aspects are always conjoined, right? That this book is a self-reflexive book. It's a myth about myth. But, um, uh, yeah, I, I know that a lot of people read the, this book uh, in this way, but I think that there is places that Blumig himself make this um, analogy to the uh, idea of the Opsian state of nature. So let's compare this book to the Leviathan. And we have state of nature. And now what we want to explain, we want to explain over there why we have a state and there is a sovereign state and that we obey the laws. Now, of course, he said that nobody uh, give us assurance that it was a state of nature. <laughs> now, for me, the state of nature is the, the beginning of the book. It's as speculative as the state of nature of Hobbes. Now, what kind of justification Ops gives to say that if you keep this in mind, state of nature, why it's rational to obey the law? So I want to say something the same way here in the case of Bloomberg. This is my story uh, about why we started to tell story, uh, why 
There was a situation that human being or homo sapiens was challenged and one of the way that he uh, react to this challenge is to start to tell me, uh, stories. Now I need to justify that. Where, how, how can I justify that? You said naturalistic or empirically I cannot do that. So I'm using now some kind of tools. So one of the tools is say, let's go to take the Prometheus story and to see why it um, survived. <coughs> And then by saying that it survived, I want to say that it's explaining or justify on explaining that. But this is only, you will never say that explicitly, because when you start to speak about the Prometheus things, what is important for him to emphasize is the idea that we have a certain kind of story that nothing to do with now with the content of the story, that that have the ability to endure variation without loss this so this is the descriptive things so what i just wanted to e exemplify is that bloomberg is not clear about their argumentative relationship between them because i can say i will you know what the first part you know is speculative i don't know why he do that maybe he read some nice things about science or something like that and i can start from prometheus yeah and prometheus i will take the content of prometheus now human being was over there, very poor creature, and then came this guy and gave them the fire, etc., etc. And, et and you, know, you know that there are a lot of people that start the story of civilization immediately from Prometheus without giving you the account that he gives in the beginning of the story. So the question is that he put both of them there, and the reader, this is my perspective, is challenged with the question why you put both of them if I can get a justified reason why I can read each one of them separately. And it's the same case with Goethe. So Goethe start a new story, and all the time we are in demand to give, at least maybe uh, Bloomberg say, you read to my book too much of, I don't know, call not analytical philosophy, too much argumentative um, um, uh, load. You know, you think that you must have kind of structure. And uh, no, I started to write these things, I dealt with this mythos to logos, one thing. Now I go to Prometheus, then I find the relation with Goethe, the third thing. But I came to all of his book as someone that, as, as I started with this, uh, what I call the basic presupposition, that there is argument over there, and I'm trying to reconstruct them. This is my. So for me, it's not a theory of myth, but for me, it's the claim, uh, the, the, the basic anthropological claim. This is the, the thing that he put forward and he tried to find a way to justify it. So this is for me the case. So this is why, even though a lot of people take it as a theory of myth and say what is the difference between him and the other, I take it as someone that has an anthropological assumption and is looking for argumentative tool and sources in order to make it reasonable for us to agree with this uh, 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 assumption. So this is my, I, I, only if there is. It's really a question because I'm not a Blumenberg expert at all. I know him a little bit in the context of Scholem and so, but I have a, a question. Uh, did he in some way uh, read or deal with Walter Benjamin? Because I was reminded of when you were talking about mm -hmm. storytelling, about uh, the, the, the Erzähler, you know, mm -hmm. which is an entirely different, it's a pessimistic com com concept, I would say, about the end of myth or something like that. In this context, I just want, it's just a question of, because it would be interesting, um, I would, su would suppose that in his setting of mind, he, he dealt with living people like Sholem, but I'm not sure that he, that he took notice of, of Benjamin, which was edited in the 70s and, and 80s, that's or 60s already. I'm not aware of something that he, that he uh, something that I read uh, about the connection with Benjamin, but maybe some other can uh, illuminate us with this, but it's not something that I know about. No. So again, here of course, <coughs> to go back to the, very short, to the, of course, here <coughs> will be more easier to compare him with with Galen and other uh, uh, anthropological philosophy in this case. So, but the question is if 
one of the things that I need to continue to do is to, to see what makes this description different from the one that, uh, uh, for example, Galen and other. Okay. The very, very last word. Yeah. Right, right. As short as possible. Yeah, yeah. Well, you always cut me short. Um, I, I'm curious because it looks to me that you made a psychoanalytical story out of this anxiety issue that uh, humanity has uh, facing reality as an absolute. And uh, you alleviated uh, alleviate by baptizing things with names like Chava in the Bible did. And I think Wittgenstein was right about this, that you look at something in the dark and it's scary, and then when the light is shining on it, suddenly no problem. Okay. That's a wonderful comment. And now we go back in the dark and go out and thank you very much.